Welcome everyone. Um, I think the previous panel spilled over a little bit, so I'm going to give it another 30 seconds just for people to filter in and settle down. Um, of course, this is going online as well, so once we get started, we will have an audience in the room and an audience across the world, hopefully. This is a good time as any to just run a quick round of housekeeping announcements. It would be great if you could keep your phones on silent through the conversation. At the end, I'm definitely going to have time for questions. And if you raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you and the question can be posed then. Do try and keep your questions brief uh, so that we can get in as much perspective as possible. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Thank you for joining in um, at 5 p.m. I realize it's us that's between you and your evening drink. So I appreciate the fact that you're all in the room today. But I think this panel is fitting because for me, at least, it's a conversation that makes me hopeful. It makes me hopeful for a couple of reasons. One, the fact that this year at the festival, it's been amazing to see so many conversations around climate. I'm really happy it's not a fringe event anymore, and it's really front and center of any discussion, really, of what's happening with news and with reportage. The other thing that makes me hopeful is the fact that there are so many people here doing such fantastic work, whether it's within newsrooms or without them, around building communities for journalists. And and the third thing that makes me hopeful is Saturday evening, because it's different from Monday evening. So this is a good time as any. And by the way, for our audience joining virtually as well, Eid Mubarak to everyone who's celebrating. So let's get straight into it. Maybe I will take a second just to contextualize who I am and what we do, and then I'll introduce our really fabulous panel. My name is Mitali Mukherjee. I'm director of programs at Reuters. And what I lead, which is why I'm here having this discussion, is our newest baby called the Oxford Climate Network. This was born a year back, uh, already has has almost 300 journalists within our community. At any given point in time, we scan about 97 to 98 countries in terms of the faces we have. So from the Pacific Islands to everywhere in Africa, to Malaysia, Nepal, we really love that bit. We are consciously online only, which is how we've been able to get that kind of spectrum and that kind of diversity. Uh, and I think we really love what we do, and we love the community that we've built, which I think might be the case for everyone who's gathered here for this chat. So let me do a quick introductions. Gustavo Faleris is an environmental investigations editor at the Pulitzer Center. He's led programs for the Earth Journalism Network. He founded a collaborative geojournalism platform. And now, of course, he works at Pulitzer as coordinator of the Rainforest Investigation Network. Jessica Davis is Senior Director of Data Initiatives and News Automation at USA Today. She leads a team that's changing the way weather and trends are being reported. And uh, she's also Wood Wood, a member of the Oxford Climate Network, cohort two. And Katerina Kropshofer is a founder of the Austrian Climate Journalism Network, one of the three established national climate journalism networks in Europe. She's been doing what I can safely say is the very hard work of community building and um, really keeping connections going between journalists. Welcome all of you. Thank you for joining in. Let's do a little bit of brass tacks first in terms of why these kind of networks are important and why they're important for climate journalists. So maybe we'll work our way from the end of the table up here. Gustavo, you want to go first. Thank you, Mitali, and hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think it's a, a, a very fascinating question because I, that's something that I, I, I think a lot about the, um, what I like to say, the, uh, the scale of the climate problem and how networks help us to, uh, to tackle it. I just I, being very direct, I think it's in, impossible to do a comprehensive coverage of climate change without a, a network approach. And that's basically because to do a good climate story is not going to be one story. Yeah. And it's not going to be one story in one point of time, and not one point on Earth. I think for doing a comprehensive coverage, we'll need, of course, a lot of stories in different geographies and over time. Um, I like to say sometimes when I'm doing a workshop, 
that the good thing about being a climate journalist is for sure you have jobs at least for the next 50 years, maybe 100 <laughs> years. You know, like if you want to cover the, the climate. Are you uh, happy? No. Are you working? Well, yes. In, in, in <laughs> kind of an economic perspective, if you're covering the, the Paris Agreement, you certainly will cover until 2050 at least. And if you want to do a, like a global view, you need to know, like you have a story maybe in Brazil, maybe in the US, maybe in other countries to do this. I was saying like a comprehensive coverage. So in that sense, I think networks, um, a network approach is the only way of doing it, yeah. really, for covering a, a comprehensible geographical scale and temporal scale. Like when I say temporal scale, I usually say like uh, to do several stories about the same subject over time. For example, my beat is deforestation. I cannot do one story of deforestation saying that I'm doing a good job. I'll have to do deforestation every year to know how it's involving. Are you covering the ice sheet of the Greenlands? You probably have to do it over the next 10 years, several stories over the year. And another thing is to kind of tune your coverage according to the pulse of the earth. You know, like I'm not doing a story because some politicians are talking about floods or droughts is because I understand how the, the Earth system works and I'm tuning my coverage according to these variations of the, of the nature, basically, of how climate is affecting. So I think the network allows us to do this. That's why I think it's so important. Jessica, I might sort of tweak my question a little bit to you, which is why did you choose to be a part of a network that talks about you know, journalism and a climate context? Absolutely. Let me turn my mic on. Um, so for me, networks are really important to me. Um, I started as a reporter out west in California, and I was on the front lines of wildfires and disaster after disaster. I felt the heat right on my face as I was, literally. you know, and um, you know, fled my home at times. Um, that's where I grew up. Um, as a reporter out west. I remember moments in my early career where I reached out for help covering fires for days on end without sleep. There was no help because people weren't yet thinking about the scale of those fires, right? This is several decades ago, not to age myself. Um, and so really what, um, you know, from that moment vowed, no journalist I work with will be alone. I will always volunteer to help with coverage no matter what organization I'm in. Fast forward a few years, um, I led a team of journalists um, and made good on that vow that we develop structures and systems around disaster coverage. Um, fast forward a little bit more, my career now has taken me to finding tools and solutions to free up journalist time. And I knew that I had gaps in my personal knowledge. I'm not a climate journalist, right? Um, and so I was very clear about that in my application and I felt so welcomed by this network community. And I'm absolutely an embodiment of what you said, this is not fringe anymore, right? But climate is such an important part of our daily lives, right? That I knew that this was an important thing that needs to be embedded in our news products, in our coverage, it's not just just a niche thing, um, and so that's what propelled me to sign up for the network, and I was pleased to be accepted in the second cohort, um, and it's just been such a, a blessing for my learning journey, um, even though, right, I'm not a reporter but, uh, anymore, but it's just, been, it's just been fantastic, and I, again, I don't feel alone now on a global scale yeah. where I started as a reporter. Yeah. Right, having that one moment, never, never again if we can help it. I'm really glad to hear that and I just want to sort of pause before I turn to you to say at least for us at the Climate Network, we're quite consciously looking for journalists that have not covered climate. Uh, we understand the importance of someone who has expertise and depth, but really for us it's sort of you know, in the olden times when you would go to the optometrist to get your eyes checked and there was one lens and the other and then one really fit. It's kind of like that. So whether you're covering business or lifestyle or sport, we think climate is, it's something you need to slide in there and you need to have enough background to understand what the climate element is that fits into your story. Um, for you, it was the conscious effort of building a community. Why did you feel that need? 
Um, to be completely honest, it was uh, for me it was a moment of frustration, um, and it was really sharing this with some other. I was working as a freelancer back then, and I worked for a weekly um, newspaper in Austria. But back then, it was really feeling like okay, whenever I pitch this, there's a bit of a misunderstanding um, of of the importance and the the sheer scale of this uh, problem. So. Um, when we first started our network, it was a bit of a self-help group uh, where we could, you know, share these frustrations of, of pitching, but also like working on the stories and kind of the political scale that was missing. Um, that quickly, uh, gladly turned into uh, a motivation when we realized, you know, there's a momentum for this. And there's a lot of people that are feeling the same way, and it's not just, I mean, I feel like there's lone warriors in every news organization that have realized the importance of this topic. And also, as we've heard, you know, the, the I mean, the positive sides of this, there will be jobs in this for a long time, and there's so many stories that can be told. Yeah. Um, and from realizing this, we quickly grew, and the resonance we got so quickly really showed us we were onto something. And also, you know, we had a bit of imposter syndrome of like, why can we as very young uh, journalists just found something like this, yeah. but if nobody else did it, then why not? Um, yeah, and this is how we started, how we grew. I mean, the nice thing was that through our network, people that were working at the same organization found each other. Um, very often they were like, okay, there's another person from my medium. I mean, those are the bigger newsrooms, of course that also thinks the same way, let's you know, get together, let's go to our editor and see how we can introduce some structures that would really make a difference. Yeah, um, it's a good time to do a bit of a dipstick survey. I don't know if this room is very representative of it, but how many folks in the room at this point are part of newsrooms or work with a particular news platform? If you could just indicate with a show of hands. And how many of you have an editor, uh, any editor who sort of handles climate and you can go to to understand what a climate story might mean? Okay, I know my research colleagues at Reuters will hang me out to dry for doing such badly researched data, but that doesn't look like a good figure. Gustavo, is that, is that part of the problem also for journalists who want to understand climate, which is that they're not getting the help they need within the newsroom, which is when networks like this become really important? True. I, I think there is um, uh, a lack of um, understanding in a lot of newsrooms on the Again, on the scale of the problem, it's not just about doing a coverage of one conference or you know, like creating the beat. It's something that is happening in major newsrooms. Luckily, now you have like the climate desk of the New York Times, or you have like climate correspondents. Now, in AP, has created a massive program of climate correspondents. But if we look at the importance of the climate issue in a local level, it's we know that's not happening, and because of resources, but not not not. We want to blame the editors or the owners or the publishers directly. I think it's it's a, a, a transition that will need to happen. You know, like for creating bits uh, inside. So the networks certainly are an opportunity. I, I I I launched, let's say, my my career as a climate journalist because I got an opportunity for a fellowship with the Earth Journalist Network, and that changed my career. So that, in in a sense, I see the, the examples that we are seeing here or the the network, the Oxford Network, as. First, as an individual impact, you know, like the person becomes an ambassador of the issue, not an activist, please, but you know, like an ambassador of climate journalists. So that's a, a first impact, and then who knows? You have like the organizational impact. The the the, the outlets start to change from inside, and I think the networks helps in this different level of impacts. And who knows? We can get to the real impact in the society by doing the, uh, the journalism. Uh, the, the example that we have with the Rainforest Investigations Network, it's even more specific because we're we, uh, helping journalists to make this connection in a very concrete way. What is the relationship between the rainforest and climate? Because you get a lot of reporting it's like, we need to save the Amazon because otherwise everybody's going to die. True, but why? And then becomes the problem. Where's the data that proves that? You know, like, we all need to be concerned about the Amazon, you know, why? Where is the data? So the network is for us to exchange the ways of telling the story, to find the data and define the methods for doing really concrete stories that matter in a local and a global level. Yeah, which sort of raises a more technical question perhaps, Katerina, which is, 
you know, how would you describe the importance of a formalized network, which, you know, sort of comprises members who've made a conscious decision to join it versus a more spontaneous or informal collaboration? What do you see as the power of a more formalized network? I mean, most of us in the network, we're not in leading positions. Uh, we're all, most of us are reporters, so what we can do by this, and this might sound corny, but like if you have the backing of you know, 50 other journalists that also stand behind the same principles, you can go to your editor, uh, you can go to conferences, you can you know, spread the word about what you're doing and really feel like you know, there's more people behind me and we can exchange uh, this knowledge, whereas before I already did that, but I feel like I didn't get where I needed to go. And when I say this, I mean, uh, we heard this as well. It's not, you know, climate change is not just a single story that you pitch. I mean, that as well, but we always say it's a, a dimension of, of everything. And what you said before as well, it, it means that every reporter, it doesn't matter on which desk or for which beat you're working, um, has to have a basic understanding just like human rights um, or democracy. It's like a literacy that everybody should have. And I think that's why, you know, having communities like this, also the Oxford Network, can set this, this basic level of understanding of this, of, of this dimension, of this big thing that we're talking about. Um, and yeah, it just makes you stronger when you move forward. Jessica, you know, you're in a unique position where you made the conscious choice to understand climate better, and then you had the opportunity to go into a newsroom and effect change with it. What did you find? <laughs> Say good things. <laughs> Make us hopeful. You know what? Um, anytime we learn something, we get really excited. And at the, you know, with the network we talked about, be smart about how you bring change back to your newsroom because you're more excited and they don't understand your why <laughs> behind why you're so excited about that. So I really thought through that and tried to find, okay, um, I really took away climate attribution as very actionable now, right? Climate impacts are happening now. So what does that mean for our coverage? How is our audience engaging at USA Today in our 200 plus local newsrooms in our network across the US from coast to coast? And how, what, what is the opportunity there, um, you know, with, with my role of using automation and AI tools to help our journalists tell their stories better. Um, and really what I found was, okay, we are a subscription model. And so that means that building habit with our readers means publishing a story about the weather happening daily, weekly, monthly in context was something that I saw was the biggest opportunity that we could help our journalists, not replace them, but help them do that more consistently. Um, so the earliest one, and we're still, we just went live at the Arizona Republic, so we're starting small. Um, and uh, what we're doing is uh, we automated severe weather alerts um, for that community. We have the infrastructure in place to publish that across our network. We're going slowly because these are automation tools, um, but all, it's all built out um, and ready to go. And so they're testing it for us and we put context in that reporting. Um, and so the tools that we're using allow us to template. Um, it's going to start there. Eventually, I do want to layer in even more attribution. Um, and so that's where I have built the roadmap out of what that progression will look like. But I'm making sure that our journalists and our reporters inform what those stories look like, making sure our audience response is what you know we need it to be. Um, but it's been very early days, but it's been very positive. Because when you're there for people, more regularly, at least daily, weekly, they're more likely to turn to you. I think TV, uh, local TV journalism does this very well, yeah. <laughs> right, with their meteorologists. And so for our network of local newspapers, we have to be there, right, and explaining this is what's happening. And, you know, you're seeing more, <laughs> you're having a severe, um, like a flood warning now, but you've had more flood warnings in the last five years than you've ever had before. That's a really simple statement. We have all the data. There's tons of open data in the U.S. Um, that we've scraped and automated and cleaned. 
And so putting that in context isn't as hard and none of our journalists are alone, even if they don't have data expertise in being able to tap into that tool, into that framework. So, you know, if this panel was just a few months further into this year, we probably would be publishing in more markets. Um, but I'm a big believer in, you know, testing s small and then scaling. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's an amazing point that you make about the importance of local journalism. Uh, just as an, as an example, when the devastating floods happened in Pakistan, there was so much that came out by way of global reportage at that point, but it was the local reporters that were really going to the regions that were the most difficult to reach and talking about what was going ha that happening there, both in terms of socioeconomic distress and otherwise. What's interesting, though, is that the feedback we got from a lot of journalists there was that I don't know enough and my newsroom can't support me to contextualize this story the way I should. So the tilt often, say, for example, in a newsroom in Pakistan is about how the establishment has failed the people, which it well may have, but where's the support for these journalists to understand it in a climate context? When we were chatting yesterday, though, Gustavo, you were talking about this local and global uh, you know, collaboration and how networks are really important in terms of doing that. I'd love for you to share an example of a story where that happened for climate journals. Yeah, sure. I have uh, several stories, but if you allow me, I, I just want to uh, say a word of enthusiasm for what I, I just heard from Jessica, because I knew I, I really believe in what she just said. I think that the role that we're going to play on um, providing a service on simply distributing data and then adding the layer of context, which is the best value that journalists provide, is fantastic. I mean, that's what I really believe that we can do. We've seen a lot of dashboards of journalists in the last few years, you know, like this kind of a putting together a lot of, of, of data in the same place, but the fact that automation allows us to start distributing alerts, it makes me really hopeful of the role that journalists will have on helping people to not suffer too much with the climate change, basically, you know, like, and I think we have this, we have this role, really. So I wanted to say that I was super excited when I heard that. Um, but the examples that we have a lot of, uh, we are find out, finding out fascinating things with this network about the rainforest, the RIN. Because uh, we knew there was like a lot of complexities on supply chains. So one supply chain that we work a lot with the uh, uh, TBIJ, the editor Robert is here, is my uh, great partner. It's on, on food systems, for example. We know that the beef uh, supply chain connects the entire world. You know, like what's being, the cattle that's being raised in Colombia and Brazil is reaching Egypt, Russia, China, US. The companies are global. And the only way of getting to the bottom of this problem is to have a network that is global. It's like, can we work with a Russian journalist together with a Brazilian journalist and show the supply chain to like step by step really, or like gold. Gold is such a big problem nowadays. The pandemic, the price just, exploded, it's a very safe asset, as everybody knows, uh, and so there has a big rush of the less, maybe, uh, reserves of gold, which are, I guess what, within indigenous territories. So you have like a human rights problem, violence problem, of on the ground, that you have like a very poor miners without trying to, you know, like glamorize or anything, but you have like very uh, uh, uneducated uh, working class that is just uh, up for anything on the ground that is connected with the richest bank in the world. So it's a, complex, <laughs> it's a complex system. But I will talk about one story that was fascinating, again, with the colleagues of, of, of TBIJ. We recently published, published a story about collagen. Uh, some of you might know about this uh, frenzy and the rush for the beauty and the wellness that collagen can provide. So it's being big in terms of uh, uh, propaganda in the US and, and, well, several countries to achieve uh, consumers. And uh, our fellow Elisangela Mendonca did a, a wonderful story showing like how this uh, massive industry that's growing so fast is linked to deforestation in Brazil. And this again, it's not a vague thing. You have to show every step with documents and everything. And it, it is possible to show that that farmer, that guy locally is selling to that bigger guy that sells through, even a bigger guy that ends up in Nestlé. So that kind of story that needs to be really concrete, change things in a way that are more objective instead of like just a, a, a vague message that problems are linked. We're seeing uh, complex supply chains that connect uh, the entire world in a way. 
Katerina, does that work in a national context as well, where one reporter picks up a story and says, hey, I have some bits and bobs here, but I haven't been able to add it all up. Can someone help me with it? Um, <clears throat> yes, although I have to say that our network for now has been uh, focused more on, you know, doing press briefings okay. um, before like bigger um, political uh, events like COPs and FCC reports coming out. Um, so yes, there's people that find, you know, collaboration in our network, but I think our main um, goal right now is more to, to connect over, you know, building structures that are needed. Maybe it's Austria as a small country that is not um, yeah, it's not the head of the game in this, let's say it like this, uh, when it comes to climate reporting and when we look at the US there's a lot more happening, for example. Um, so we do that and that's our main focus, but it's definitely something that we, we would have the platform to do. Okay. Jessica, what did you think were sort of, you know, what is it that you were looking for when you went into this? Because, you know, I'm conscious of the fact that so often you say a network is important, but all of you are journalists who come in with truckloads of experience. It's not like you don't know how to do your job. You know how to do your job. You're just looking to understand how this new beast sort of fits into your reportage. What is it that really helped you? Was it, you know, access to material? Was it talking to other journalists from other countries? What worked? I mean, it's a fantastic, really well thought out program. And again, highly recommend it. And I was not prompted to say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really believe no it. Drinks Evangelizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely apply. Um, and I think like for me, I was just very much on the front lines of, you know, my teams and myself were covering disaster after disaster. Um, and just feeling like there's more context here. And our climate journalists at USA do a fantastic job of putting those into context, but I just felt that I had my own learning journey to do, which is ongoing. Um, and what I really appreciated is there were reading materials, there were speakers that don't just talk about the theory, they make it real. There's journalists invited to share what they're working on. Um, there's a chance for fireside chats that are you know, not recorded, more off the record, or safe space to talk about what you're struggling with, what you're not understanding, asking people, what do you think, what's your experience? Um, and because it's such a global, well-represented group, like I, I didn't know about some of the impacts happening in other parts of the world. Um, and, you know, now I'm connected with those journalists um, and can ask them questions. Um, sometimes they ask me questions um, and, you know, that's not something I was looking for going into it, but it's been, you know, an enriching part of, of my career since. Um, so, you know, going in, it was about my perceived knowledge caps. I mean, climate. Climate's a lot, um, <laughs> I just gotta lie. There were just, I remember talking to Kat about just like, oh, the, these these terms, I like don't even understand them. Um, <laughs> but, but I felt safe to say that and um, it, it was important to me, like I know, I could say attribution now, like I know what that means and that means saying, is it the effect, impact of climate change or not? Um, you know, just that alone, you know, shows like, hey, they, this room's full of people that, you know, do climate journalism, but it, it really does make it more accessible to, mm -hmm. to the newsroom as a whole. And you raised two important points, both of which I want to unpack. Um, one is, of course, the mental health impact and trade-off here, and the other is, as you said, very skewed access to information and material. Gustavo, I mean, we found that, and perhaps you did as well, the situation for journalists in the global south is markedly different from what's happening with the global north, that's one. And the other is that if I want to report on a story within my region, I'm very often pointed again to the four experts sitting in a university in Northern America who are going to tell me what the problem with my region is. Is that something you experienced? Um, I as a reporter myself, I was lucky to have good sources locally because of, again, of the deforestation issue is so uh, present in our lives uh, in Brazil that I, I didn't feel personally so much of this. But we do have some um, 
projects that we are now running in the, in the network that where we face that. Um, and again, the network helps a lot on, on bringing um, approaches to deal with that. Um, it could be, you know, like um, how to build layers of information that you combine scientific knowledge with uh, local knowledge. A lot of the stories that are, are local um, outside of the, let's say, like the major countries where the research about climate change is happening are, it can sound like a criticism, but I think it's, it is a criticism. <laughs> I don't want to be specific about one story, but sometimes I feel like that is like a lot of like opinions about people who knows about the climate, but you know, like, oh, the climate is changing. I used to plant like this, but I cannot um, um, have the same crops. I think this is, uh, of course, this is, opinions are, are important, but not sufficient. Yeah. So in a way, I, I, we, we try in the network to create this idea that you need several layers of information. Again, coming back to the global and the local, how you combine the scientific knowledge with the local knowledge. More and more indigenous voices coming to the report to represent what climate change is. You know, like this knowledge, like the, the, the traditional knowledge of the territory needs to be present, for sure. That's the, the, the thing. And sometimes this is missing on the Global North reporting. So how you combine the university voice with the indigenous voice. And that can be done, you know, like with a mix in a very practical way of field reporting with data journalism. So these are the layers of information that I, I, I want to mean. It's like if you bring the, the very rigorous field reporting with a very rigorous data journalism analysis, I think you can combine these two words. And I, I know you bring also the perspective of you not feeling alone or the, the, the I think the mental health. And in that sense, I feel that the, the network brings the technical knowledge, but also the knowledge for allowing people to go in key places where it's not easy to get in, uh, inside. So like the security issue in the rainforest regions is, is real. Yeah. So what we exchange also is like uh, security protocols. It's not only how you approach science, uh, data journalism, and traditional knowledge, but how you actually go into uh, areas of conflict, environmental crime, and do a, a, a good reporting without putting yourself in risk. So the network, in a way, also helps uh, uh, this knowledge and security protocols to be shared and to be standard. We're creating more and more standards on how these people should do this reporting. How are you building that? I'm curious because that's something that we're you know, really discussing in our climate network, which is how can we best support our journalists by way of mental health support in what is often a very lonely space to be reporting and at other times a very dangerous place to be reporting. In countries like mine, for instance, even reporting sort of, you know, slipped targets on uh, coal usage could mean that you are instantly uh, in, in the face of a storm and this is state-sponsored machinery. How do you support your network? Well, there are cases by cases. Um, I think one, I have a, a, a recent case that I'm, I'm looking at, it's not directly from our network, but it's from a friend. And I'm, one simple thing that I'm realizing, which I realized for myself as well over the years, like we sometimes think that we are tougher than we are. We're like, okay, I'm going to see all this disaster. I'm going to all interview all these bad guys. I'm going to hear all these people suffering and I'm good. I'm just doing my story. There's a moment that you, that will come down on you. And then I'll have a cry in the bathroom, and then I'll come back and be brave again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think we can help people by allowing them to share and to be open about that. Yeah. I heard a story about uh, war correspondents that were invited for a fellowship to uh, deal with trauma. And they were supposed to sit in a room and chat and share experience. And they said, like, the, the first three days they were just in the bar, <laughs> 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 pretending that nothing needs to be talked. You know, like, they were like, oh, yeah, we're okay. You know, but I, I don't think I've seen so many stuff that I I don't think we're in the end will be okay just by pretending that we are okay. So in that way, that's one simple thing that I I, I think I learned. But in a more practical way, um, there's no way of doing like a field reporting without having a risk assessment, a contingency plan. Like how's your network? Or how's your newsroom will respond if you have a, a problem? If you disappear? If you don't respond? If they so. We are advising our fellows to have all like um, the satellite kind of uh, coming in reach, this kind of um, trackers with them. It's needed. We just had a case that we proved that was totally needed and the backup plan. If the person is harassed or disappeared, 
the plant has to start to, to row and, and you have the, the measures to avoid the worst. The case that we have in the Amazon uh, last year, it was really important for us to, to be aware that there's no more space for just go and nobody knows where you are or what you're doing or not having a contingency plan. So I think risk assessment and contingency plan are the, the key things. Katarina, I imagine it's different for different contexts and communities, but you know, what's the sort of mental health load that you're experiencing with the network you speak to and how do you guys support each other? I mean, just being here in the last days and having so many conversations about um, climate change and climate reporting um, makes me realize how important it is to have this platform where you can talk about the frustrations and this ongoing fight, um, especially knowing that, you know, probably for the rest of my career I will be having these conversations. And what is helping me massively is also, you know, testing my, my arguments because we are under attack on so many levels. I mean, there's so many people that still label what we do as activism, which is of course not like on the same level um, of what you were talking, but it still is something that is discrediting the work that we are doing um, because, you know, it is an important, it is an important um, part of this job now and we can't uh, deny that, but yet it is still not getting the quality and quantity of what it should have, um, at least in Austria. And I think just knowing, you know, like fact-checking this, you know, how, how did this go for you and sharing the story, um, I mean, how I normally respond, maybe I can share with you as well, is when somebody accuses us of activism, I ask, you know, my colleagues that uh, write um, on corruption, if you know they they also want corruption to go away, uh, if they're writing about it. So you know, I want uh, climate change to be stopped and um, as many measures as possible taken against it. Uh, so this is also not activism in the same sense that you know writing against corruption is not necessarily activism. Yeah, uh, I remember a sort of friend colleague who actually founded the Oxford Climate Network, Wolfgang Blau, and I talking about it and. I think he made an interesting point, which is that when people say, why are you interested in climate, you should respond saying, why aren't you interested in climate? You know, you explain yourself, why should I? <laughs> but, uh, you know, Jessica, I think you made an important point at the start when you said you're starting small. And I think that's amazing because part of the mental health burden is also I'm not doing enough. My newsroom doesn't hear me. Um, I'm not getting things done the way I'd like to. Is that important as well to sort of celebrate the small wins and the big ones? It, it's the only way for me because yeah. I, I work with 200 plus local newsrooms and a national newsroom. So I could get paralyzed very easily, uh, <laughs> you know, just yeah. trying to figure out where do we start, how do we do this? It also gives me the opportunity in some of our local markets where this is very politicized, where there is denial in the US about this issue. And so that's why I thought, let's just start with what's happening in the weather, let's put it in context, is that's what I took away, was like, that's really powerful. It's not maybe enough to change the world, but it's a start. Um, and most importantly, toward the network and the bravery of the journalists that are on the front lines of this, is supporting them, right? And making sure that wherever possible, how can we use the open data use, you know, to help them so that their reporting efforts are getting the first-hand reports that really make this a, a, a human story that we know, like, that, that has impact with our audience. It makes it real to them. Um, and then the data journalism behind it, as you shared, puts it into, okay, I understand what this means for me in a way that really only data can. Um, and so, I'm, you know, I feel like, uh, if all I can do is, is just support our network of newsrooms, and I'm not alone in that. Um, I, I also am working with Climate Central to make sure that their experts are available to our journalists um, because what the value of automating these you know, weekly, daily stories is that frees up our journalists to, you know, hey, what's the analysis? What's the deeper dive? And for some of these local newsrooms, um, you know, having a resource like Climate Central, where they, you know, have a whole part of their organization that make experts available for specific U.S. data, right? That's where, um, you know, just trying to look out. And then, yeah, I mean, we we all sort of tied in 
to now the, the Oxford Journalism Network, Climate Journalism Network. So it seems like compared to where we were even just two years ago, it's just, you know, I remember my, my lone voice, not alone, feeling the impacts. We know in the West, right, attribution, the fires are worse because of the drought there. Um, that's, you know, that's where my journey started. And if these products can help our frontline reporters, then mission accomplished <laughs> for me. <laughs> Indeed, and, and many more to come, I'm sure. Gustavo, you know, one is the impact that's happening at an individual level and the other for networks like this, because often you keep getting asked why, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is that you're really, you're creating an institution that can be a powerful actor and that can demand accountability when an individual voice can't. You know, this is what happens with the power of a network. All of you stand up and say, hey, that happened at, at COP and that was discussed, but where's it gone? Uh, do you believe that too? Yeah, no, totally. And, um, and that applies for exactly the, the kind of investigations that we are doing. Um, if you were, um, I also want to show um, um, the complexity of some of these issues, if you're having several outlets and individuals working together, it definitely will get more attention. I, I think that the audiences understand that too, you know, like that uh, the collaborations on, on a publishing level are very important. So I, I, there was a lot of panels about collaborations in, in, in this conference and, and I think this is, a, a reflect, is reflecting the moment that we are living, that the audiences they believe that some of these issues can only be done if outlets are collaborating as well. And the collaborations coming from the individual, they are transformative for the journalists because they will have to uh, change their view on competition. They will have to change their view on how to share data. They will have to, um, to share their, their view on how to communicate in a transparent way. So these collaborations, we are very lucky at this network to work with um, uh, our editor, Marina Walker, who co coordinate the Panama Papers, and she has a methodology on how you should behave on a collaboration. And that's so interesting. You yeah. know, like uh, you have to be transparent, you have to, to share your, your document, you have to share your data. So this is a transformation on an individual level. And again, for the climate issue, that's just perfect. Yeah, um, I'm conscious of time, so I have sort of a question that's two sides of the coin. and. Thank you for the shout out, Jessica, but I do want to also, for anyone who's listening and tuning in, we would really love to have everyone who applies at the Oxford Network to join us. We can't, I'm sorry. The last time we got 900 applications for 100 spots, so we're really trying. But what I want to do for anyone who's listening and thinking, hey, how do I do this for myself or for my community? I want to hear from the three of you, A, how you can do this if you want to, and B, because, a, a dose of realism is always good. What's the hardest part? Let me start with you. What's the hardest part? I start with the positive side. Go as well. on then. Um, I wanted to share like one more example of what we did or a project that is now ending, um, which is kind of like a, a charter. Uh, we sat we sat together and we were like, okay, what are the core principles of what constitutes good climate journalism for us? And we came up with the most basic yes. things like saying, you know, the, the, the urgency of this um, needing the, the proper climate visuals. Uh, we got some scientists in to give us, you know, the sources for everything that we were saying. And we went through this uh, process of inviting in journalists from different um, newsrooms um, discussing every word, which was a very a long process. Um, and now we kind of have this this tool that newspapers or journalists working at newspapers and outlets uh, can use to go to their editor and be like, if you want, you know, this is like a charter, it's like scientifically backed. We got the Austrian press agency on board and that says we're going to put, you know, your logo on our homepage. And it's kind of like a, a stamp of approval that you can have. Um, and it also means, you know, you, you get into conversation with your editor um, about which are the structures that you need. And it's less about changing editorial guidelines or, you know, the, the specifics of, of each outlet, but giving individual journalists that feel like they want to do something, um, yeah, a, a toolbox of, of reaching out and doing the first uh, step. And this is something that everybody in every country can, you know, just copy paste. It's a very simplistic model, but it works. Do you have a hardest part? Do you not have a hardest part? 
a hard part, sorry. What's the hardest part or is there not What's the hardest part? I mean, I still think, you know, people in power um, are the ones that call the shots. And if you have someone um, that has not understood the urgency of this topic, then you might have a hard time. And um, I know that at the newspaper where I work, it was definitely not an easy ride, but we do have a climate desk now and it's a very small uh, publication, but it makes all the difference because it's, you know, the kind of stuff that you can't argue anymore. Like every week there will be one story at least on, you know, biodiversity or climate change. So it gives me hope to know that, you know, you can, um, you can establish yeah. these structures. For you. Um, how to start? I mean, I started with the data, the open data um, available about weather and climate in the US. So there's so much rich data that, you know, you don't have to be a data journalist. You can seek help from these networks to, you know, find stories for your publication. The hardest part for me continues to be solving for news avoidance around this topic and others, but especially this topic. How do we get audiences into this um, in a way that they, they stick with it? Um, so for me, that's the, the hardest part I still am solving for and testing toward, um, but, you know, just publishing stories, trying, learning from that audience feedback and from our newsrooms of what's hard for them. Thanks for that question. It's really thoughtful. <laughs> So uh, to start, I, I also uh, agree with my uh, with Jessica and Katrina about that. Um, I would add that apply for everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, like there are so many fellowships, so many opportunities for grants. Like, uh, I I had this opportunity to start like that. I was like, okay, let me try this. And I'm saying this because it is important. Although there is like, like a, some a skepticism about the kind of. A, multilateral agenda, it's very important to go to these conferences. Um, it's boring when you do so many times, but when you're starting, it's so important to be in the biodiversity conference, in the climate conference, and to because everybody goes there. That's the truth. So you make a lot of sources, you understand the kind of the major issues. So I, I do think there's a great value on though the kind of a hard, uh, the hot coverage, you know, like the hot topics. So that's how I would uh, suggest to start. I think the, the hard parts are not just one, but many, like to persist, especially if you're trying to create something that is your website or something. So there is a lot of other issues that we'll have to deal with, right? Yao, who has leading a, a website in Malaysia, is like well, now the funding, now the team. So there's other things that are beyond the coverage itself. Um, but I, in a more conceptual level, I think the challenge for many journalists is to not become cynical about this issue because it's going to be a big issue. It's going to last for a long time, and there's a lot of people doing like greenwashing and trying to, uh, you know, like not give the hard news. And you, you cannot uh, uh, give up of giving like you know like the hard facts and keep covering and, and bringing the solutions as well. I think that one of the hardest parts for us is telling a different story. Like what are the alternatives for the root of the problem that we have now? Yeah. We do with stories that really goes on to this, like yeah. I, I'm not seeing many actually. Thank you guys for sharing that. Before I open up for questions, I just want to take a second also to acknowledge my incredible team that runs the Oxford Climate Network, Diego Ortiz and Catherine Dunn. Give the audience a wave. <laughs> They're around uh, this evening. If you applied and you didn't get through, you know, hassle them. <laughs> they give me a hard time, but I love them because they push back so hard on what is really, really vital for the network. So let's open up for questions. Raise your hand. We'll try and get you a mic and get your question going. Yeah. yeah uh, by the way, I've been rejected two times uh, for this. So, but I'm going to try. You and know <laughs> and the question refers to that. I mean, uh, I'm speaking as a rookie climate journalist and I wanted to ask about uh, some advice because uh, when I see, when I have some, uh, when I got some ideas to do big projects, big investigative projects, I feel sometimes that I'm, I'm not good at it because it, it's, it's very uh, challenging sometimes, like get the funds, uh, get uh, uh, also because sometimes you have to be a known journalist that has some uh, publication before to, to get uh, some European grants or international grants. So what would you recommend about it, where, where to start uh, in, to, 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 to become an, an investigative journalist? 
I, I think, I, sorry, I missed your name, but uh, um, I think that will repeat a little bit of what I, I believe really is thinking about these layers like of um, trying to get a local context, getting the data. Like I'm doing like this because I really think like layers, like field work, data journalism, and then the network, like the collaboration. I think if you put these things together, it might work. And the collaboration also works not only on figuring out the questions, but figuring out the funds for the story. So sometimes on other outlets will bring more funds, will bring resources, will bring the data visualization. So what we'll do, find good partners on the collaboration side. Uh, side. I would have planned some uh, really rigorous field work where I'm going to visit, who I'm going to talk to, who I'm, uh, and then I would look at the data and how am I going to bring this bigger scientific context to the story. So that's how I, I think we are doing in this network, like combining these three things. Did you have so, a question? Yes. yes. Another question here. So just to to give you a cheerful note, don't give up. I was rejected two oh times my before God. I got <laughs> I got into the network. So I don't give like up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would like to, to go back to what Jessica was talking about uh, and the news avoidance um, aspect of the, the difficult part of reporting on this. So um, the, the role of networks in um, uh, reporting is awesome, is amazing to see um, newsrooms collaborating, freelance journalists who meet in, in networks like the Oxford Network, you know, collaborating. But then I want to hear from you guys if uh, you have any examples to cheer us up also of collaborative work that you did that really resonated with the audience, you know, that people really got engaged in, in discussing, uh, you know, in sharing on social media that really had an impact. Well, the story, what the story is about is not cheerful. Um, <laughs> But our uh, investigations data team did uh, a really great piece on um, a big flooding threat in the Oklahoma City area and, and collaborated with that local newsroom and got to, you know, we, that story wouldn't have been possible by USA Today alone. And so that collaboration between that news, those two newsrooms within our network was really important. Um, so, you know, the, the key findings of that reporting, you know, were more doom and gloom level, but it was really important because it had the local voices, it had pe the faces of people. Um, and I think that's where in, in the first layer of news avoidance is can you make it real? And I said that before, but you know, our network leveraging that to find, you know, how do we make this real to people? Um, the fantastic data, you know, journalists and investigations team at USA Today, um, you know, gave the heft and the context that that local newsroom could, you know, they, they could never do that on their own in the time frame they did the reporting. Um, so for our internal network, you know, kind of a downer story, but <laughs> as most of these are tough. Um, I, I would love to hear if there are any of you that have done any solutions, um, but, you know, if you have examples of solutions ones, um, you know, that would be great to hear. I mean, not a specific um, story per se, but there was a recent survey done um, on Austrian, you know, media consumers, and it turned out that 68% said they wanted uh, much more or more climate reporting. Um, and 35% said, you know, what is like covered right now is, you know, I, I, I need much more. Um, so there is an audience for this. And I think um, I have a science background and I was more of like the science ad, but I feel like there is a climate story in, in everything. Um, and it's not so much just like having, I mean, these are very important as well to have like the classic stories on disasters and communities, etc. But it's just like having this, this thought in like every story you do is, makes all the difference as well, I think. So I can sort of buttress that, not in terms of a specific story, but data. Um, last year, Reuters did research across eight countries, including the US, UK, India, Pakistan, led by my colleague Vakas Ajaz, and I was part of that as well. Two things struck us. One, that audiences across these countries trusted scientists the most. It wasn't about the hokey pokey bits, not even in countries like the US where climate can be quite a polarizing topic. That was one reason for hope. And the other, the fact that 
they often felt a bit overwhelmed with the bad news. So they were looking to journalists and newsrooms to contextualize things. Why is this a big deal? Where does this fit in? How should I process this? And what can I do about it? Um, I think that, you know, just as Gustavo said, that that gives us a lot of hope because that gives us the, the, the chance to do something about how we communicate. Um, I hope that's useful. Hello. Is there time for one more? I think there is. Okay. Go on. Um, thank you so much for this. Uh, Gustavo, I really liked what you said about integrating the lived experience and the data. I think that's a really important part of, of covering climate. And I think the data uh, analysis gives the journalists more time to focus on the lived experience. I'm a solutions journalism trainer that's done work with the environment. And I know there's um, other people here that also do that. So I'm wondering, what are the challenges that you face when you're covering solutions? And I'm also wondering if you have examples of community engagement with the, with the people that you are covering. How do you follow up and make sure that the people you are covering are also getting the benefit of the analysis that you're doing? Um. So we, I, the, the, the example that I, I would like to, to share, it's one of very interesting, there's one thing that it, it happens at, at the Pulitzer Center without trying to be really propagandistic here. That is the, the what happens after the story. So they're growing more and more, the, the team that works around finding other audiences. Because as we know, more and more there are limited audience that goes in the website or gonna read the, the, the newspaper. So they're thinking like, how can we act for some people that are not in these platforms to see the stories? So the example that I wanna share is about communities of young professionals, middle class in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So they're organizing meetups of like lawyers, engineers, uh, not journalists, but and taking some of the stories for discussion. And why is that? Because right now DRC is in a crossroads of development. The, the government just announced that they want to do like massive auctions for uh, oil concessions in the rainforests. And of course, this is a, a big issue for, you know, like the, for the society. It's like, are we going to lose our rainforest, but we need to develop? So they're taking these discussions into groups and doing like radio programs where people talk about it. So it's super interesting because then the solution is not about like coming with a magic solution, but everybody's kind of engaged on discussing what is the development of the country. So I find this fascinating. And the discussions is, are based on uh, uh, real investigations that are showing the problems of this of these projects. You know? So I, I found it this uh, fascinating. And about taking some of this information directly to the people that we are uh, sometimes talking to or the sources, I've been seeing a lot of interesting projects um, in the Amazon region where um, stories are transforming to uh, WhatsApp or other formats to get, because it's a real thing about the connection. A lot of the indigenous territories in, in Colombia, Brazil, and Peru are dealing with information via WhatsApp. So that, that becomes, or like transforming into radio uh, uh, pills for distributing through WhatsApp as well to make sure that people uh, receive uh, uh, the stories that were, they were part of. Thank you guys very much for that. I just want to close with you know a quick story about someone who was part of the Oxford Climate Network and is now in Oxford working on a three-month project. His name is Radhe Sham Yadav. He comes from the western part of India, Maharashtra, that's been witness to both acute drought and severe floods. Uh, Radhe Sham is working on a solution-based project around the importance of women farmers and how they are supporting each other in western Maharashtra. And the reason he chose to do that was when he was a young boy, he saw his mother do the bulk of the farming work in the community that he lived in. And they saw floods happen pretty much on a repetitive cycle. And at the time when he was old enough to comprehend what was happening, he would see the floodwaters rushing into his hut. And the first thing his mother would do was pick up his school bag and ensure that that was put at a height that was high enough uh, to not be impacted. I think it's when he saw the power of what was happening with climate, it's when he saw the power of what he could do with his pen as a journalist, uh, and he decided to route that towards solution journalism. 
these are big wins for me. Uh, I don't know whether they tick off a mark uh, in this conversation, but I think that's what community can do. So more power to everyone who's practicing it, and a big round of applause for this fantastic panel today. Thank you all very much.